Let's get going, I think. It's 11 o'clock. So, um, as usual, I'll be running through the news, and then I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to be talking to Jeff O'Dwyer, who's um, the manager of Schroeder European REIT. Uh, I think that should be quite an interesting story. So, um, bits of news this week. Actually, it's extremely quiet, but there are a couple of things that are definitely worth talking about. So, one is this uh, is a new IPO on the block uh, called Long Term Assets. And um, also this renewables windfall tax, which happened obviously in the autumn statement yesterday. Um, long term assets first. So all it's published so far is an intention to flow. We haven't seen prospectus yet, and that means we are missing quite a lot of detail. But we do know it's domiciled in Guernsey. It's going to list on the specialist fund segment. So it's not really aimed directly at retail investors. It doesn't mean you can't buy it. It just means uh, it just makes it a bit harder to. Um, and it's got a pre-existing portfolio. So 160 million pound portfolio of private assets, unlisted things. And um, there's a sort of positive impact angle that they're trying to uh, apply to that. Um, and so that, that's because there's an existing portfolio, an existing block of shareholders, that means they can just introduce the fund onto the, uh, the market without actually raising any money. So I think it probably will appear. I mean, um, just subject to us getting prospectus through. Um, it's run by a guy called Eddie Trull at uh, an advocate called Disruptive Capital. Um, whether you know him or not, I don't know. Basically, I, I sort of Googled and this is what I found. He used to work for Hamrose originally and then Duke Street Capital. Um, and he was quite senior in the whole private equity um, arena. He was actually chairman of the BVCA for a while. Um, and then he set up a thing called Pension Insurance Corporation, which was aimed at rolling up pension schemes. Um, and as a way of going about doing that, that they actually were sort of taking over companies and then taking the pension scheme, putting it into this thing, and then selling the rest of the company off again. Um, he ended up uh, as chairman of the London Pension Authority when Boris was mayor. So I think he's kind of mates with Boris. Um, and he's been trying now for a while to get a pension super fund off the ground. So the idea is that if the government wants a significant investment in infrastructure, it's much easier to do that from a large liquid fund than it would be from lots of trying to try and get money off lots of smaller ones. That's that's the theory. Um, and he's also got this thing when he hopes to build an interconnector between the UK and Iceland. Uh, but I think so far that's been knocked back. Um, the fund itself, actually, I mean, the terms are okay. 0.55% annual management fee plus a performance fee. We don't know how that's going to work. And that will, again, be in the prospectus. I'm guessing it might be 10 or 15 or 20% over that 7 8% hurdle. Um, it wants to grow. And the theory is because we, if you put these sorts of assets into an investment company, um, the shares in the investment company are now liquid. And... Um, you've turned something that wasn't a liquid asset into a liquid asset, which is really quite helpful if you're a pension fund and you're worried about your liquidity in the wake of what happened with the um, liability deposit insurance. So, oh yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so um, it's a good way of turning liquid assets into liquid ones. Um, so there'll be funds will be able to stock swap and these are liquid assets into the fund in exchange for shares in the company. Um, anything that they don't really want to hold because it uh, doesn't fit the kind of ESG criteria will be held in a kind of realisation pool with a separate share class. So that's quite a neat way of doing it. The only thing I'd say with all of these things, that all these kind of stock swap funds that I've seen, doesn't matter how big they are, they all end up trading at discounts. So they're relying on people coming along thinking they, they, look, they look like interesting assets, I quite like to own those. And as we know, private equity tends to trade on big discounts at the moment. So we'll wait and see how long this works for. It's the sort of thing that, that might trade an asset value and expand quite quickly and then move to a discount, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, this is what's in the existing portfolio, and it is just a collection of things that have, have been sort of Eddie's pet projects, including this interconnector idea. So um, as I say, that, that's just not off the ground yet, as far as I'm aware. A um, couple of kinds of medical hotel related assets there. Um, he ended up buying tenant for the pension fund um, and um, they still got the, that business. And other bits and pieces that, that, that are in there as well. So it could be interesting. Uh, just have to work to prospectus and see how that all works out. Um, now, windfall taxes. 
So I think I, I put these slides up first. This is just showing you the performance of the sector. Um, nothing's 10 years old yet, so we've got no, no 10 year column. They have, for the most part, had very good year in terms of any NEV because of inflation and power prices and that sort of thing. Um, and obviously soaring NEVs, the share prices haven't quite matched um, because of what's been going more recently. And so now these are now ranked um, in terms of discount. And you can see there are only now five of the 22 funds in the sector that are trading at a premium. And that, that's obviously a big turnaround. We used to be that everything did not that long ago, really. And some of these discounts are really quite big now. So there are two reasons for that. Uh, one of them is the rising discount rates. Um, but so far that we've, we've seen any of these announced with uh, chasing discount rates. And as we've been saying for weeks, uh, just because rates go up two percent doesn't mean discount rates go up two percent. There, there's no linear relationship between the two. It all uh, is comes back to what price do these assets change at? Uh, hands out in the secondary market. Um, so discount rates are a factor, but but maybe not the end of the world, uh, especially now that long term rates seem to be coming down again. Um, and the other factors being what's going on with windfall taxes so as we know these have been repeatedly ruled out and then ruled back in again and, and then proposals have been made and laws have been passed and nothing's been done about it and then the plans change so it's we've got to have sort of right muddle and um we've now got a firm plan at least um and i was saying to people at the investment week awards last night it feels a bit like they've devised something that generates big headlines, but it actually doesn't impact on the sector too much. Um, so we did see share prices bounce a little bit yesterday, but um, it is quite a difference between who's caught and who isn't. So the, the new, this new levy, which is they're calling it electricity generated levy because you can't we'll call it windfall taxes, we don't do those, um, starts in January and runs until March 2028 as things stand. So it's coincident with the uh, windfall tax on all the gas companies. Um, it's a 45% tax on extraordinary revenues, so sort of excess profits, if you like. Applies to non-fossil fossil fuel generators, uh, so obviously catches all the renewable sector. Um, and it also applies to the revenue above from power sales, and just about power sales, so not subsidies and things, just the power sales, above a baseline of £75 a megawatt. So they're saying that is their sort of estimate of where the market was before um, things started to get crazy. Um, it doesn't apply to anything that's been um, secured a sort of contract for difference revenue stream. So all of the auction rounds that have happened in the past um, five or six years doesn't apply to those. And for example, Bluefield has got a plant, Yelvertoft, which um, they're, they're planning to build, which um, has sold its power through this sort of CFD arrangement. So it gives you a fixed inflation in price going in the future. And that, that doesn't come under the scope. Because I think what we say, this is, this is what the, we thought the direction of travel would be to move to these sort of CFD arrangements, but still we've got this wonderful tax. Um, because they're trying to get this sort of de minimis thing going here, um, to you have to generate at least 100 gigawatt hours of power to be included in the tax. And you also have to be making at least 10 million pounds of excess profits. So revenue above that 75 pound per megawatt limit. Um, and so there, there's a big variety of, of um, funds you know, that are either impacted or not impacted. Now, the next few pages we talked about, I'm just looking at our clients. Um, because I didn't have time to do everything this morning, but the whole sector. But um, and these are very rough and ready, back of the fag packet type numbers. So please don't take them as gospel. But Bluefield Solar generated uh, 624 gigawatts of power over the year to the um, end of June 2022. And obviously, its portfolio is growing, so it's probably going to do more than that um, in the year, next year. Um, so it, it does tick that 100 gigawatt. Uh, box, so therefore it gets included from that point of view. 
Um, when it announced its results, it said that it had sold its power forward under power purchase agreements. Um, and in Jan 23, it was looking to get 126 pounds a megawatt. And in July 23, about 124.9 pounds a megawatt. Um, so there's a big sort of, you know, 50, 50 pound a megawatt um, excess return there. Um, multiply those numbers up, you get about 31 million pounds, 45% of that, 14 million. So this fund, I think, probably will get caught and probably will be paying some money. But bear in mind that in its NAV, it's, um, I do show you the power price curves that it's been using before. They drop below 75 pound a megawatt um, in about 2025, 20, 26. So to the back end of this windfall tax um, arrangement, chances are if power prices work out the way that they're, they're forecasting them, they won't be paying anything. So we were probably only talking about windfall taxes for the first couple of years, um, and they're not particularly huge. I mean, they're, they're, they're sizable, but they're not particularly huge. And remember, this is just the revenue from the power prices, from the power sales, and it doesn't apply um, to the rocks and subsidies that they you know, fits that they've got. So um, it's a hit, but it's not the end of the world. Downing, um, they tried to sort of be helpful and put some numbers out in October and come up to this. But obviously, we didn't know what the shape of this was. So again, it's sort of slow estimated. But because they've got quite a lot going on in Sweden, um, they've only got about 59% of their revenue coming from the UK. And only about 41% of that is coming from power sales. So they just about, I think, well, 155 gigawatts, they just about fall into the, the bracket from the size point of view. But they're also forecasting a sale price for power of about 82 pounds a megawatt. So they're not making enough excess return to, to fall into the windfall tax bracket. Um, so I think they're not going to be effective at all. And I talked to Tom Williams at the company yesterday, and, and he sort of confirmed that. Uh, he, he doesn't think they're going to be effective. But obviously, all these things we have to wait and see. Um, how things work out in practice. Um, Jalen, uh, actually, it generates quite a lot of power because it, it, it's got uh, you know lots of different um, arms to it, the wind and the solar in particular. Um, so even more than, than Bloomfield. No, Bluefield, yeah. Um, the annual report's complicated. It has hedged a lot of its output for 2023. Um, definitely the wind and the solar, and not so much of the anaerobic digestion output. Um, and so, depending on what those power prices are, um, they talk about 130 pounds a megawatt, but I'm not absolutely totally convinced that that is the, the right level. But, but let's say it is at that. That would apply excess revenue about 72 million and tax about 32. But fortunately, um, to, because we're not going really to in the dark too long, it's going to be announcing results for 20th of November. So I'm expected to say then what the hit, what he thinks the hit was going to be. And similarly, Next Energy's got results on the 21st. So they'll be beering away over the weekend to try and get this worked out. Um, I think this is one right is right on the cusp. Um, so although they do generate quite a lot of power, and a lot of that is in the UK. They've actually sold forward their power at 73 pounds a megawatt, so under the 75 pound uh, limit. So the only way that they could actually get some excess return would be on the balance of things that they haven't actually sold in the power purchase agreements. Um, and I think based on that 130 pounds megawatt price, we're talking about nine and a half million quid, so just under the 10 million pound level. Again, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what they say on the 21st. Um, but it is going to be interesting. So it's going to be different things for different people. Um, I imagine things like UK Wind are going to be caught within this, but some of the smaller ones won't be. I'm getting some questions on this, so let's answer those before I hand it over to Richard. Um, if government's seeing declining tax revenue from fossil fuels, then won't the tax burden just fall on renewables? And so I suppose what Kevin's saying is, they, do you think it might extend beyond 2028? I think it's entirely possible. 
Um, but remember that power prices are supposed to be coming back down again. Um, and it's not that long ago that we were worried that long-term power prices were, were actually getting so low that, that some of these things were sort of struggling to make money. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't worry about that so much. Um, will it catch property companies that install solar to sell to their tenants? Um, so things like a Trato, uh, that sort of thing. And also, I suppose, um, some of the other property companies that need putting solar on roofs. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's the size threshold. I think it's unlikely that those sorts of funds are going to get caught with the, with the sort of size of, that we're talking about here. This de minimis thing was going to get them off. Um, so will the government drop the threshold if it doesn't collect as much tax as it thought it was going to? It's possible. Um, we, you know, I think we, we can't speculate too much on this. We just have to go with what we know. Um, does the tax apply to revenue earned on private uh, direct PPAs to third parties? So things that don't go into the grid. Uh, yeah, I think it does, because um, it's, it's all power sales, regardless of, of how they're made. Um, but most kind of private wire arrangements, so where, where somebody's built a plant for a specific factory, say, or something like, something like that, and sells it under power of private wire, they're mostly done at reasonably low prices. Um, and I, again, they, they might not fall under the, the um, banner um, because of that. Anyway, that's enough. Let's stop there and um, hand things over.